so we're moving into um, uh, a new session talking about um, several related things, um, but they are quite diverse. So we have project management, funding, hosting, all of those good things. Um, we're quite lucky that we've been able to get a couple of people in from the local university, uh, Victoria University of Wellington from their computer science department um, to provide a, a, a perspective outside the stock assessment group. Um, some people that actually their job is developing software. So it's going to be very helpful for us to, to understand um, how we might uh, manage these projects. And Jennifer is going to give the first presentation talking about the agile software um, development. And then we're going to follow up on a related uh, talk um, as well. Right, thanks for that, Mark. Um, I guess I should stand somewhere here. Um, okay, so I'm a lecturer in uh, software engineering at Victoria University of Wellington, just up the hill. And I'll talk to you a little bit today about agile software development. And um, I guess it's up to you to decide whether that's something that's useful for you or not. Um, so. It would be good to, to have discussions around it, and I'd be interested to hear your perspective on it as well. So it fits in the broader topic of software development process. Um, you know, in software engineering, it's a huge research area. How do we actually go about developing software? Um, it's about, you know, how do we identify distinct phases in the work of software development? So we break it down to requirements, finding requirements, design, implementation, and the verification of software. And each of these in themselves are large research areas as well. So what I'm going to talk about a little bit is um, agile software development, which is a very specific instance, I guess, of a much larger research area and which I have most experience with. So. As I said, there are many models out there, so this is not the only way to do it. Um, I've been working with software development teams since 2007, so uh, I've been keeping up with what's been happening in practice. A lot of my research is with actual teams. Um, so what is it basically? Oh, sorry about the... <laughs> uh, this is converted from Google Slides to PowerPoint. Um, it's basically... A collection of technical practices, of project management practices that are trying to harness uncertainty um, and, and put in place uh, opportunities for collaboration, self-organization, and iterative and incremental uh, development. And in software development, a lot of the uncertainty comes from um, one area is the customer, so the person who delivers requirements to the team. So, um, you know, software developers have run over the years into a lot of trouble trying to define requirements, customers who don't know necessarily what their requirements are, and uh, business environments change. So, you know, a month later they come back and they say things need to change. But a lot of uncertainty uh, in requirements can also come from the actual process of coding. So once move to the process where we implement the requirements, we learn a lot of new things, things, um, new constraints come up and so on. So um, it's all about trying to handle, um, I guess, this, this idea around, you know, we don't really know what we're going to run into down the line. So I'll talk a little bit about specifically how agile development handles requirements about the teams. Uh, some specific challenges for scientific software development that I'm aware of, and then, you know, if you haven't tried agile software development, where do you start kind of thing? So that's what I'm hoping to do today. So is there anybody here who has no idea what agile software development is? <laughs> <Okay>. um, <laughs> good. <laughs> well, um, one way to do it would be to talk you through the process. But I think when, when people do that, it's really easy to go, oh, that doesn't suit us at all. That's not going to happen. So I'm going to try and take a different approach, so we'll see how that goes. Um, so in terms of the agile requirements, I think there are three important things to understand. The first is um, agile planning horizons. 
the concept of user stories, and the backlog. So when it comes to time horizons, um, as I said before, Agile is all about handling uncertainty. And what we try and do is we break things down into the, how far can we see into the future, basically. So we can come up with a daily plan, which we review on a daily basis. So um, in Scrum, for instance, we do a stand up at the start of each day where the developers can talk about what uh, they're going to do for the day. Uh, we have a plan for the iteration, which lasts one to two weeks. So I get distracted with the pointer and then I don't go through the slides. So this is the, we can see sort of for the day, we can fix our requirements for the day, but then we can also fix our requirements at the iteration level, which means that uh, we fixed our requirements for one to two weeks, and that's the point at which we uh, review the plan for the iteration, one to two weeks. Um, our bigger program is broken down into um, a program in increment, sometimes called a release, which happens every six to 12 months. So understanding, I guess, these sorts of um, time horizons, these planning horizons tells us at which points do we fix our uh, requirements and how often they get reviewed. Um, so the other thing to understand is that as our requirements, we, we often contrast it with the waterfall approach, which is sort of, we know everything up front and then we go off and do it. And two years later, we have a software product and then we show that to the customer and the customer is like, this is not what I asked you to do at all. So the idea is to uh, get away from that and take an iterative incremental approach to development. Now there is a difference between incremental and iterative and agile development combines both, right? So incremental would be when I know the requirements up front, I understand the full picture but what I do is I break it down so that I can um, sort of in small, smaller iterations of one to two weeks, build them up incrementally like a building block. And eventually I get to my full picture. Iterative is I have a more sort of outline idea of what I want in terms of my requirements. And as I go through my one to two week iterations, I fill in the details of those requirements. So if you can imagine these two pictures sort of superimposed on each other, then you understand as our requirements. The other thing is the user story. So how do we express requirements in agile software development? So it's sort of a balance between a very loose language, natural language approach and a very structured uh, approach to expressing requirements. So we have a template as a type of user, I want to do some goal with the software so that, and then I can give some reason. Um, and these user stories, the development team would sit with the customers to come up with these stories. And, and this is how the team collects requirements. Usually, well, in the early days of software development, um, early 2000s, uh, the advice is to put it on a card like this, so an actual physical um, card. And why did they do that? Because it's, it's an artifact that the team can move around between developers, they can touch it, they can show it to each other. And the other thing they can do is then arrange it, um, as seen in the picture here, uh, of, on a wall or on a, on a whiteboard. And you have these columns, so it starts off here in the team backlog, which I'm going to talk about next, and it goes into development, and your story sort of moves through these processes until it gets accepted by the customer, and then you know you're done. So a physical movement of these requirements through these processes indicates to the team what the status of each requirement is. So that's something useful. Um, as I said, the backlog... A backlog is 
like I showed in the first column of the previous slide, is just basically a list of these user stories. So each um, rectangle here represents a user story. And we might know a lot of possible requirements, but the very defined ones are the ones right at the top that have been prioritized accordingly and will be implemented in iteration one. And you can see the size of the rectangles are supposed to indicate the level of detail to which they're specified. So again, thinking about the, the time and the planning horizon in agile software development, we know maybe one to two weeks, we, we have some specifics around our requirements. But as we go further and further into the future, we have ideas about what we want to do. They're sort of specified at a high level. And as we go through the process, these bigger requirements will become more and more specified as they come into the iterations to, to be worked on. Okay, so it's just a way to keep track of these uh, requirements. And um, these are the kinds of things that happen. So each user story is put on the backlog and the developers will estimate how long it'll take them to do. Um, part, um, requirements can be reprioritized during the planning meetings, whether that's on a daily basis or the iteration, depending on what the requirements are. And they can be refined and so on and taken out. So this is a sort of dynamic list. It's not, you know, you haven't built your pillar and then it sort of stays there. It's something that changes as the team progresses. Right, so then I'll move on to Agile Teams. Uh, just checking how long have I taken, okay. So, uh, Agile Teams are traditionally self-organizing teams. So, um, developers decide for themselves what requirements they implement, what stories they take from the backlog to work on. Uh, they're traditionally multidisciplinary. The idea is that uh, the people on the team are actually people who have the skills to implement the product that you're working on. Um, and so you have very basic roles, okay? The idea is that you have a product owner, a scrum master, and the team members, so the developers in general. So I'll just talk quickly about the scrum master. A lot of people think about them as project managers, I guess but instead of assigning tasks to people, they make sure that the team um, sort of doesn't run into impediments as they work. So they sort of clear the way for the team in terms of the business and making sure that they can follow these values. Has anybody seen the manifesto for agile software development? You can go to agilemanifesto.org in 2001 um, the founders of Agile software development, people like, if you've heard the names, Kent Beck, Alistair Coburn, um, Mike Cohn, people like that. They put together values and principles for Agile software development that underlies the way the teams work. So things like um, individuals and interactions over processes and tools, working software over comprehensive documentation, customer collaboration over contract negotiation, and so on. So what they're saying is these are the things that are most valuable to the team, and these things are a little bit less. Not, not valuable, but these are not, this is not the focus. So that, to allow the team to focus on these, we need the Scrum Master to make sure that, you know, the environment in which they work is set up appropriately. Now, the product owner is the very important role that takes care of the backlog. The product owner is the only person who should make changes to this backlog. Now, I've seen businesses that don't respect that, and it gets very, very messy. So, uh, it's better to just stick to the original advice that is given, and that is to let the product owner make changes to the requirements. But obviously, in consultation with the team, with the customer, but also, again, thinking back to the time horizons, um, keeping things fixed during the sprint for the developers is actually very important. So not allowing 
um, changes that happen down here to impact the work that's happening um, in the current sprint and so on. Then of course we have our team members and these are the people who turn our user stories into code, doing these technical practices like pair programming, unit testing, continuous integration, refactoring, etc. So technical practices um, to turn user stories requirements into code. And then of course, we can't forget the customer. Um, this is the person who is the source of truth for all requirements. They have deep knowledge of their business domain. And the assumption is that they're always available to the agile team. They're always there to have those conversations with the team members during development. So it's a big commitment. And the other thing is that it's not just, it's not necessarily the end user as well. So customers are sometimes business representatives, but they're people who understand the requirements and understand what needs to be prioritized for their business. So I'll just make a quick note about uh, the coll collaboration model in agile software development. So it's all about sharing knowledge, um, about sharing ownership of the project. So there are certain assumptions built in, things like the teams are co-located. Everyone in the team is in the same room sometimes. Um, they're doing pair programming. So everyone understands the code base. Everyone understands um, you can rotate people around and they would be able to, to continue the work. And also that all meetings are face to face. But uh, as Agile has scaled through the years, um, this is not always possible for everyone. So Agile has now got quite a bit of research behind it in terms of the distributed models. Um, but still, they, and so they've come up with some extra practices for, you know, how to still get people to have this, you know, collaboration model to, to share knowledge and ownership. And it could be through any of these. Um, for instance, if, if po uh, pair programming is not possible, then doing code reviews of each other's code, you know, give people um, this research to suggest three to 600 lines of code is ideal uh, at a time to review before the software gets merged into the main code base, for instance. So that could be a way to deal with um, not being able to do pair programming. Um, and also then there are these other things like um, regular video chats, having video uh, conferencing for meetings, rotating team members between sites, and so on. So looking at agile, at um, scientific software development, I, my images haven't come out, but on all of these on the left-hand side, so I was doing some reading just to see uh, how it's doing in this area. And if you can just imagine a big green tick next to each of these, um, there's evidence to suggest that um, these are being used and that have been used successfully. On this side though, a little bit less. So pair programming, unit testing, for instance, is just not as, um, yeah, it's not as well understood, I guess, in this area. So just finally then, how do we get started? Um, my, su my suggestion would be to assign one person responsibility for the product, whatever the product is, something that makes meaningful sense, um, a bunch of requirements that are in a coherent thing. And then that's the product owner role that I was talking about. The next is to develop this collaboration schedule around your planning meetings. So who's going to be involved daily, who's going to be consulted um, one to two weeks, and who's, who's keeping track of the product roadmap, where we only need to check in perhaps one to two years ahead around changing requirements or updates and so on. So this collaboration schedule gets people to commit at the beginning of the project and understand what their commitments are in terms of the development. The next one, to make infrastructural decisions for the whole team so that everybody is working on the same 
uh, same version of Java. Oops, sorry. Um, everyone understands how they can communicate with each other, whether they're going to be having video conferencing once a week, uh, whether they can communicate over email and so on. Source code management, we talked a lot about Git, GitLab and so on, that needs to be discussed and set down for the project. And what sort of testing frameworks and integrated development environments and so on the team will be using. So it's just a matter of synchronizing across these things. And then I guess the next thing is just start small. So a lot of people uh, try to take a big bang approach to agile software development. They run into some issues. They realize the business is not aligned with their time schedules and things haven't worked out. So they give up at that point. So I would just recommend that um, maybe starting with a pilot team or a pilot product um, before rolling out to, to the larger business. And then finally, inspect and adapt, two very important keywords for agile software development. We have to check what, what we've done is working and we have to understand uh, why it hasn't worked and how we can improve. And this happens continually throughout the process. Right, and that's the end of mine. Yeah. So we've got time for questions, but um, the next talks are very related to this one. So unless, if, if it's a clarification question, then I'll take it now. If it's more of a discussion question, then we'll take it after the next presentation. Yeah, Malcolm. Uh, yeah, interesting stuff. Although there was one bit which I thought needed a bit of clarification. You said uh, working software, which I thought um, fine objective, versus complete documentation. Now that surprised me to see that. Uh, in that if I don't the, document system, code yeah. when I write it, that's it, it never gets documented. So why, why would you have that up there? Yep, so the Agile Manifesto um, favors working software over complete documentation um, because the evidence of progress and the measure of progress in Agile software development is measured by the software. And um, at the end of the day, so you want to not discard practices like documenting code. So um, coding comments, things like that. You want a good design, but that sort of happens through the refactoring as you're implementing. Um, so that's still there. But if we think about heavy sort of code specifications, uh, UML models of our software, that's kind of less important because we're not measuring our progress against those models. Okay, again, let's stick to clarification questions. Um, I've got one. You mentioned paired programming, you say that's important, but I'm not sure if I understand what that was. Yes, so a lot of these things I, I skip over. So paired programming is where two developers will sit together at one machine and look at the same piece of code at the same time and do some development. Okay, uh, a clarification question? Yeah. Okay. Uh, back to the, the documentation again. Um, does, does that uh, refer to documentation about the structure of the, the, the code, the architecture, if you like, not user documentation, not usage documentation for users? Yeah, yes, yes, to do with software, yes. So if there's a requirement around um, having to produce manuals or whatever for the user, then that will have to be written as a user story um, and put into the uh, backlog and prioritized along with the other coding tasks. Okay. So okay. that could be because the, um, in the agile way of doing things, the, the, the system isn't really fixed in the structure because you, you don't want to document something that's going to change, is that why? Correct. So we assume that we don't actually know what we're going to end up with at the end, and we're going to refactor as we go, so the structure is going to change. Yeah. Great. Okay, let's move on to uh, Craig's presentation.